seems like, is this loud enough? Do I need my outdoor voice? Everybody's good? Okay. Well, we'll get started. For those that don't know me, my name's Art Matheson. I'm the CEO of Copley Hospital. I just want to uh, take a, a few seconds to do some housekeeping. I want to thank our board members. I'm not going to... Uh, I'm not going to go by name, but thank them for taking time out of their schedule to be here in support of us today, as well as many uh, colleagues and also family and friends of Copley Hospital. Thank you for your unwavering support. Uh, board, I'd like to thank your administrative team for their great collaboration and working hand in hand with our team in getting us to this point today. So thank you very much. And then last but not least, I want to thank uh, my team members here to my right and to my left for all their hard work in preparation for a budget that we feel is real, uh, transparent, and uh, a budget that we feel that we can live with. So before we go any further, Art, as usual, I forgot to, to ask the court reporter to swear you all in. <laughs> <laughs> I think all that was true, what he said. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Would you all please raise your right hand? It's going to be this group, too. Okay, all right. Um, do you all swear that the testimony you're about to give and have given shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I already messed this up, too, so this is on me. Let's see if I can. Oh. Got to be smarter than the controller. <laughs> agenda that was presented to us and it's pretty much in order of what, what we were provided. So hospital issues. We were thinking of changing this but we wanted to stay in line with what we provided as hospital challenges. It may be semantics but uh, we feel that these are challenges that can be uh, worked on and uh, in a positive way can be overcome in many instances. So I want to say that with these challenges, not in order of importance here, but one of the issues or challenges that we are having is trying to get to one fully integrated health information system. I talked to some of you, many of you know that at Copley we have three electronic medical records. One inpatient, one outpatient, and then one in our ED. Not to mention just staff frustration at times with having to go into two systems or three systems where they're trying to take care of you. Uh, but also the biggest thing that keeps me up at night is safety. And one of my big jobs is mitigating risk. And what's the risk of doing something? Well, what's the risk of not doing something? And usually the latter is the one that worries me the most. And so as we go into our second year of our strategic plan, which we talked about last year at this hearing, uh, three key areas that we're focusing on. One is getting an EMR across, across the full continuum of care is very important to us. Then also focusing on our building and then also focusing on our orthopedic center of excellence. I'll talk more about that later. Recruitment and retention. I was here a number of months ago, board members uh, talking about the challenges of recruitment. If you remember, we talked about our general surgeon, happy to say she should be arriving in a couple of weeks. She did buy a house in Morrisville, so we're pretty confident that she's still coming. We are gonna continue to be challenged by this. And this is not a Vermont thing in my belief. If you remember last year, there was a a study done by the state that uh, talked about through 2030 what our challenges would be in various specialties. And 
we are going to have many shortages. And we are going to have to find creative ways of trying to get physicians and other highly skilled professionals to come to our beautiful state. Facility medical equipment, always going to be a challenge. Most of our hospitals are pretty antiquated. I think ours is well over 50 years old. And then medical equipment to uh, assess our patients as they come through the door. It's just expensive, and it's always going to be expensive, but it's necessary. Financial challenges, I'll leave that to the guy on my right to get into the weeds on that with, with future slides. And <laughs> my other right. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> Thank you. The last thing that I, I wanted to put on here was uh, addressing the, the determinants of health. And this is a challenge. Uh, I'm not trying, and we are not trying to uh, be negative with this, but we just feel it's a reality. When we sit around uh, our table as a senior team, or as key leaders in the hospital, this is something that we're challenged with uh, daily, weekly, monthly. And the reason why is uh, we have, like most areas of the state, like other states, finite resources and so many needs. And the question is, how can we put those resources to one area for the, the best, for the biggest number of people? You know, biggest bang for your buck. And that's not easy. And as I was talking to uh, the healthcare advocates uh, that are here a few minutes ago, this is a long game. This is a marathon. And it's something that we just have to get after every day. So, as you can see, many of our areas of risk uh, are also challenges on the previous slide. Finances and capital requirements. Something that I say to our staff is no money, no mission. It's just the bottom line. With the new EMR selection, there's, there's one piece of getting a new EMR for, you, for your hospital where uh, you want to select the right one, you want to get buy-in from your staff, um, and, and that's a process in of itself. But the thing that scares us the most at Copley is the implementation of a new electronic medical record, and this is why. You can predict the cost of a new EMR, right? So there's a, there's a startup cost, and then there's uh, a cost over, let's say, a seven-year period. And say that's $3 million. It's a lot of money, without a doubt but it's predictable. But where a lot of hospitals, particularly small hospitals, go wrong is not that side, but is the revenue cycle side. So if you don't plan that accordingly, you can have millions of dollars caught up in the hinterlands, not coming into your facility, and you run out of cash. And that's not a good enough reason for us not to move forward, uh, but it definitely is a concern. I talked about recruitment and retention already. Healthcare reform. I really like some of the things that we are doing with Population Health. We have the Rise Vermont platform. We're going to talk to you today about uh, a number of things that we're doing at Copley uh, that are, I think are helping with Population Health, uh, preventing disease, etc. Uh, the other piece of that is payment reform. And I, I want to say that last week we had a presentation from OneCare and I, I told them afterwards, and I mean this, it was by far the best presentation I have heard in three years. It really gave us the numbers, the data for our board, um, our FQHC, who was also at that meeting with us, uh, to really make a decision about going risk um, for Medicaid for uh, the upcoming calendar year. And I was asked, and right now, my answer is uh, we're, we're on the fence, but we're strongly considering it. Uh, areas of opportunity, uh, I talked strategic plan, uh, general surgeons coming in, and I think it's important to understand the challenges, although this, this is an area of opportunity, but I'll talk the challenge. When you have one general surgeon at your hospital, Don Dupuy, he, he and I arrived here at about the same time. We, would, we had been trying to recruit a general surgeon uh, long before our arrival. And what Don has been doing, and he's been a great sport, is essentially pulling call two, three weeks a month um, for three years. 
and we finally have a great partner that's joining him. But if you're looking just from the business side of cost, it actually costs great, a great deal more money to have a temporary surgeon allow Don to take a, a few days off every month. It's an incredible amount of money, and uh, that, that money uh, you know, really is a challenge for our hospital, not only in that area, but other areas as well. But we're excited. I'll talk more Rise Vermont in further slides. Day-to-day uh, -day operations, I'll cover that, and then I'll, I'll move on. Some of the board members were part of our certificate of need uh, process. I'm glad to have closed that one out. And if you remember, one of the big questions was utilization of our OR rooms and then our procedure room. That was one of the big key things that we were looking at, that you were looking at, the key metrics. Now with the number of surgeons uh, and other providers that we have on board, uh, we are having to become very efficient in the utilization of our OR, as we should. Um, as of 1 September, we are making monumental changes in the usage of our ORs in procedure room where uh, essentially almost every minute of every day of every OR room in our procedure room is going to be utilized because we, we don't have uh, any more room in the house, so to speak. So it's number of surgeons and other staff are going to fill those four rooms almost completely each and every day. And uh, it remains to be seen in the future what we're going to do, um, but that all comes down to access and a number of other things. Uh, a lot of collaboration is going on, has been going on, and will continue uh, with other hospitals, the FQHCs, and we have had great relations going on with academic institutions where we're trying to build our own bench. And then we'll talk more about our community health needs assessment and follow on slides. So wait times. I want to let the board know that we decided to update the data on this as of August 15th, so last <coughs> Thursday. We just felt that was the most up-to-date information. The one thing that really stands out there, the one real change, is 107 days for new patients into cardiology. Uh, Adam's here. He wanted me to remind you he has patients at 1 o'clock so he can help <laughs> decrease that number. Um, we, we, and I think you know this, we use third next available appointment to look at access. Usually first and second appointments are anomalies and don't give you a good look at what true access is. Uh, this may be an anomaly, we certainly hope it is, but I know that right now uh, Adam is at least in the 50 to 60 days uh, out for new patients. Uh, Adam does just about uh, everything that a, a cardiologist, a general cardiologist can do, works hard every day, but those are the numbers. morning. I am here with my co-chief medical officers, Don Dupuy, our surgeon, and Adam Cooden, our uh, cardiologist. I'm Lori Perfada, your chief nursing officer, and I hope that uh, we together can inform you about our quality work that we're doing at Copley. Access, access to primary care, access to transportation to and from the hospital, access to local services, housing, dental care, food, and counseling. In May of this year, we had a patient come to our emergency department by ambulance six times in a short period of time. Once we were able to drill down and meet the patient where they were at, we were able to identify that with some food, with safe housing, with transportation assistance and companionship that we could help this individual stay at home and in their community. We continue to collaborate with our community partners to provide timely access to safe, effective, quality health care. We continue to engage in prevention strategies 
to keep our patients out of the hospital and healthy. Our health service area continues to meet and exceed five of these eight APM quality metrics. Although several of these are mostly closely aligned with primary care, we're committed to our community partnerships, to having a positive influence in our primary care outcomes. In FY19, we'll continue to build on our strengths, our social worker in the emergency department, which you will hear wonderful data and stories about today. In that role, a shared position with our uh, community health partners that has grown to a permanent position in our hospital this year. This position has handled over 500 referrals in the last two years to patients seeking primary care. It has identified 77 complex care patients and high utilizers in our emergency department, connecting them with our community resources early at a time of discharge from the emergency department. We will continue with our shared position of a social worker in the Women's Center, where enhanced screening in connection to state agencies, community resources, improve health outcomes in our mothers, our newborns, and our families. And in FY19, we will focus on our strengths and our opportunities in areas where we can make an impact, where patients access our health care, our health care teams, our surgical center, our specialty clinics, our acute care setting, and our emergency In FY19, our goal is to improve our screening by connecting early with targeted patients and improve quality and healthcare outcomes. We are expanding our partnerships with the Moyle County Mental Health, sending staff to be trained in suicide assessment so that we can fully support and participate in the Zero Suicide Program. We continue our focus on chronic health conditions through enhanced blood pressure screening and education with targeted populations and early identification of readmission risk prior to discharge in our acute care patient setting. <coughs> in FY19, our partnership with Chesla will continue as we add an additional shared resource who will work with a social worker in the ED and our care management team. The objective is to enhance the screening of substance abuse, mental health, social determinants of health, and ACEs. Follow up and monitoring of our high utilizers, mental health and substance dependent patients. Our goal is to connect early to patients after discharge for treatment and acute care, <coughs> and to participate in our community shared care plans. <coughs> Thanks, Lori, and good morning. My name is Don Dupuy. I'm one of the co-chief medical officers at Copley. My primary task as a CMO at Copley is to both track and foster the high quality of health care that we at Copley, I think, are rightly very proud of. Whenever someone starts talking about the quality of health care, really the first question that anyone asks could immediately be, how do you know? And at least when we're talking about the quality of surgical care, the, by far the best answer is the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, or NESQIP. At Copley, we have been engaged in the program for a little over a year, and we have about a year's worth of data in the database at this point. We are just now reaching the point where we can draw meaningful conclusions uh, from the data. The first pass on it is very, very encouraging. Our observed complication rate from our operations is less than a quarter of what the national average is for observed complications rate amongst Nesquip hospitals, which are, for the most part, uh, the hospitals that you all think of when you think of really great hospitals in America. The data for readmissions and return to the OR for reoperations are essentially uh, similarly favorable. This data really is so encouraging that our initial prime uh, thrust 
is to maintain this high quality while we increase the efficiency of our operating rooms. The second program that we're very excited about is the Antibiotic Stewardship Program, which we are partnered with UBM with. The ASP uh, is a concept that the Center for Disease Control came up with quite some time ago, and CMS has recently included as a condition of participation. The concept is that antibiotic usage can be optimized to improve outcomes while decreasing side effects, decreasing development of resistance, and where applicable, decreasing <coughs> costs. In Vermont, there's a program that allows community hospitals to partner with and gain the expertise of the specialists at UVM. And I know I can say that at Copley, we've really enjoyed our collaboration with Dr. Zahern and Dr. Smith. Uh, I think we have a productive uh, partnership. Our initial, uh, our initial idea was to take three antibiotics as targeted antibiotics and try to optimize their use. We recently compared the usage for the last six months to the six months that preceded the development of the ASP program at Copley and we compared them. And I'm uh, happy to be able to tell you that their usage decreased by anywhere from a third to three quarters while producing essentially the same, the same outcomes. And uh, I certainly, it's certainly my opinion that this is really a model for how the expertise of the medical center can be used by community hospitals to get the best possible medical care uh, for our local communities. And a slightly more local collaboration, we meet regularly with our primary uh, nursing home and rehab facility, the Morrisville Manor, to review readmissions from the manor to a few care facilities. We, uh, we've met three times, and what we basically do is we look for patterns or opportunities to improve the system to keep the people at the manor when appropriate. We certainly want them to readmit their patients when they need it, but if we can apply resources in an intelligent and timely fashion, we can, we can decrease these readmissions. And so far, the manor, I'm also happy to say, is well within their target and well below national benchmarks. Finally, we continuously and concurrently review our own readmission data with the idea being that we're gonna look for patterns and opportunities to decrease these readmissions. The problem with this is that it's essentially backward looking. The readmission has already happened. And so we, we can maybe learn something about it, but what we really want is a forward looking tool that will allow us at the time of discharge to have some idea of who is at risk and what resources can be marshaled to keep the patients healthier and at home rather than less healthy and back in the hospital. Toward that end, we have adapted a tool with the acronym LACE uh, toward our local idiosyncratic situation. Uh, and we're really in the last phase of data collection. We'll soon start the analysis, and it is our hope that this will be in its initial trial phase, at least, by, uh, by ski season. Uh, hopefully, I've, I've painted a, a picture here that really shows pretty clearly that that community hospitals can really deliver effective and extraordinarily high levels of care and at the local level, which I know where, is, where my patients want to receive their care. Um, so now I'll turn this over to Adam. Thank you, Good morning. Everybody hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm Adam Cunin and uh, cardiologist, as you heard, and also the uh, co-chief medical officer, along with uh, Dr. Don McQui. I'm going to go a little bit out of order. First, I want to talk about shared decision making. Some of you may be familiar with it, but I'm going to explain it a little bit. I've been involved with shared decision making off and on really since uh, the years 1993 to 1996, when I was a resident at Mass General, working with uh, Michael Barry, who's a really well-known researcher in this area. He continued to be uh, my mentor. Primarily, I've been a user of the shared decision-making tools, but now I'm actually uh, involved in investigation as well. Uh, we worked uh, in conjunction with HealthWise to make this project, uh, which is uh, uh, 
the organization that uh, does most of the national research and shared decision making, though it's spread around quite a bit now. So what is shared decision making? Again, it's a structured, evidence-based process which helps patients evaluate the risks and benefits of various treatment options. And it's unique in that it elicits the patient's own values and preferences, specifically when there's choices to be made. And the research is pretty clear that investing more time in shared decision making usually results in a reduction in invasive treatments and cost savings. And I think it's a good antidote to some of the ills of uh, modern medicine. Uh, sometimes people think more is better. And specifically with these treatment sensitive and preference sensitive decisions, it can be really useful. Uh, starting in 2013, Copley has been participating in shared decision making for orthopedic surgery. And a couple of years into that project, uh, one of your previous board members, Alan Ramsey, came and visited, was very enthusiastic, and encouraged us to look into other opportunities to expand shared decision making. And that's what I undertook uh, with, again, uh, the help of Michael Barry. So we chose a disease called atrial fibrillation. This is a very, uh, very briefly to define the disease. It's a disease of the heart rhythm. It's uh, the cause of about 40% of the strokes in the United States. Many of these strokes are preventable using guideline-directed therapy, primarily anticoagulants. You may have heard of some of them, warfarin, Coumadin, Xarelto, just to name, to name a few. Uh, and nationwide, only about 50% of patients with uh, atrial fibrillation are actually on guideline-directed medical therapy, which is an embarrassment that uh, I'd like to see improve. So the purpose of this study um, was an intervention of essentially an education intervention to look at a group of patients before and then after the intervention to see if uh, a program education worked. It was a pretty intensive education that they went through with a lot of program questions and answers and assessment of process as well. And we, we proved what we wanted to prove. Um, and I have the study, if you want to look at it later, it's still in a draft form getting ready for submission to publication, so you can't reveal it to the press. Um, but it's uh, going to be a blockbuster. Uh, we proved that uh, patient knowledge uh, regarding both the risk of bleeding if they take the anticoagulants and the decrease in stroke increased dramatically with the educational intervention. And even more important than that, the intervention group reported having a better process of shared decision making, meaning they understood the risks and benefits. They felt it was a balanced presentation. Uh, so it was a very, this study is somewhat of a pilot study, but it has great applicability, not necessarily to cardiology, but to the primary care population where most of these patients are seen. I participated in a grant application so that we could roll this out to all primary care practices at Mass General. Unfortunately, that grant has not been funded, but we're still working on a way. That would be tens of thousands of patients uh, if we can get that going. Uh, in Vermont, I can see this being rolled out uh, via, the, via One Care uh, to large numbers of patients very applicable, it's not very expensive. Um, so this has been a, a great success, and I'm, I'm, uh, it's been an education for me in terms of uh, you know, my foray in, in mid-career into research. Uh, moving on to the next item, the Unified uh, Community Collaborative. I have the privilege of co-chairing uh, the UCC along with uh, Floyd Neese, who's also the director of the Lamoille Family Center, which is a great place if you ever uh, want to visit, and, and it's an incredibly inspiring place to uh, to visit and to work at. We've expanded uh, in the last year under the framework of an accountable community for health, uh, working directly with the Vermont Department of Health. Uh, we've established a new mission, a new charter. We have uh, several uh, initiatives, some of which Lori has already touched on in the emergency room and in the Women's Center. Uh, at a bare minimum, going to these monthly meetings, interacting with folks in other areas, mental health, substance abuse. I've learned a lot about uh, Restorative of justice, I've uh, learned a lot about uh, the hard work that these people do. And when you look at their budgets, it's unbelievable how much they produce with uh, very small amounts of money. Uh, so our initiatives involve, uh, for one, reaching outside of the provider's offices for adolescent well-trial screenings. That's a health system-wide initiative. Continuing what we've been doing for several years, which is uh, developmental screenings for 18 to 33 month olds. Uh, UCC also brings together what's called the Lamoille Care Management Team, which is a team that focuses on the highest risk groups. Oftentimes, there's only 30 or 40 individuals who are being focused on. It's usually not their medical needs. It's social determinants of health. Folks who have mental health issues, um, they have had abuse issues, they have housing and food security. 
Uh, you go to these meetings and you get a sense of uh, how much work is done in the background to keep people out of the hospital. Uh, in summary, these are the investments that we've made into uh, improving care to patients that are robust and that are on Thank you. Good morning. This is uh, Rex Arrangelis. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for Kotsi Hospital. Pleasure to be here this August as well. Um, what I'm going to go over is the briefly over the financial overview of the copy and discuss some about the cost containment efforts and what are the expense, major expense drivers for the hospital as well as capital needs and also longer range outlook for copy. So in this a brief uh, income statement, you can see our 2018 budget versus 2019. Uh, 19 net patient revenue growth is about 5.9 percent, about four million dollars. Expenses grown roughly two and a half million dollars, three and a half percent. And this would give us about two percent operating margin. As you look at the 2018 budget, you pretty much they have no operating margin. It was uh, 0 0.1 percent. You look at the NPR breakdown, there is multiple component. Uh, obviously, that we are asking for rate increase in 2019, 7.9%. We've had over 11% rate reduction in that last three years. And reimbursement increase of 2 million. Primarily, the way uh, critical access hospitals work as your cost growth outpaces your volume, your utilization you are getting a better reimbursement, so because you are supposed to get cost-based reimbursement, so that's why you see major uh, uh, increase in our reimbursement dollars. That's not all Medicaid, but that pretty much the majority of that is about, uh, from that two million, about a million and a half is a Medicaid. Our bad debt and charity care, uh, there's no real significant difference as far as our experience as a percentage of our operation, so there is no materially impacted our NPR. Obviously, uh, we've had a low utilization 19, so we are carrying some of those uh, low utilization to 19 budget. That's why you see about a million dollar reduction on NPR associated with that utilization. We also had a dish payment cut by close to $300,000 that impact the NPR. On the expense side, uh, we have grouped in the major categories, what are the expense drives, uh, we will be talking about that a little bit further. Uh, our labor cost is growing about 2.5%, about a million dollars. Our pharmaceutical cost associated with the inflation as well as the utilization is going up close to 28%. Our supplies primarily are implant because orthopedic is a big service line for coffee. That's growing about close to 7%. And rest of the cost of the organization is <coughs> state flat. So that's a breakdown of about uh, 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 two and a half percent, about two and a half million. So we selected certain ratios here to kind of uh, show Copley's trends, which is in blue, compared to the system as a whole. So if you, we saw the rate changes. So this is uh, Copley's rate changes over the last few years. You can see on 2015, we had no rate change. In 2016, we reduced our rates by 4%. Yeah. In 2017, 3.7% reduction. In 2018, about 3.4% reduction. And in 19, we are looking at 7.9% increase. Even with that increase in 19, our average cumulatively for five years will be still a decrease of 3% prices compared to system, which is, has gone up about 18%. So this is about, in our calculation, about millions of dollars going back to the the saving to the healthcare system as far as our rate reduction was over the last several years. Then we look at the operating margin. I think the last time we had operating margin was in 2015. Uh, since then, we've had losses from operation, uh, not as much in 16, but 17, and obviously this year as well. So uh, we are hoping to have a 2% for 19. That's our budget we submitted. So if you look at cumulative for Copley Hospital for five years, we have less than a penny on the dollar from operation, we have the profit margin cumulative, compared to system uh, rating, uh, system uh, operating margin over 
Obviously, all of this uh, impact at the end of the day our days cash on hand. Our days as cash on hand, uh, we, uh, we don't have the system uh, for the last couple of years, but we, you can see the gap between where the copy is versus the system average. So we have lost about 42 days of days cash on hand since 2015. And it costs us about $200,000 a day to run the business in our uh, at coffee. So that translates roughly about $8 million reduction in value of a cash. This slide is a very uh, simple slide. Uh, we were asked to break down our business based on in-state versus out-of-state. 95% uh, of our business is for Vermont resident, and 5% is outside the state. It's a simple thing. Um, over the last three years, we have targeted close to $3 million in cost containment for Coffee Hospital. In 2017, uh, about 760,000, 18 million for, and 19, and 770,000. So, so far to date, we have achieved about 61% of those uh, uh, targeted uh, cost containment. Uh, and next slide that I'll go through, uh, we'll, we'll look at that big piece of that targeted area was the labor component. Um, we are about halfway there. We <coughs> selected certain, uh, we, uh, we put the details in here, some of those areas that we're looking at. It primarily is about uh, staffing mix in those areas. We also look at the travel cost. And also we changed our health insurance plan over the last couple of years, so savings associated with that. We still have some work to do. We obviously halfway there, but it, it's a, uh, a big piece of the work that we need to figure out how we can reduce our uh, travel because we do budget for travel because that is the cost of doing business but it seems to be for the last two or three years we've been about 50 to 70 percent above uh, what we budget so that obviously is impacting our expense side. The next category of cost containment uh, is supply chain, and that pretty much includes both uh, uh, drugs as well as the supplies, primarily implants. So we've had aggressive uh, price uh, negotiation with our uh, implant uh, uh, vendors, about $500,000 savings there, somewhere around 20 to 35% reduction. We have fully implemented our 340B in our drugs, which is uh, about $170,000 savings there. And we also do a better job of managing our waste as in supplies and food and drugs. And we are pretty much about 91% there. So we are, we are pretty much there as far as that topic goes. Next topic that we were encouraged to talk about, what is your uh, expense driver for the hospital? So we have identified three major categories, which is probably will be a common theme amongst most hospitals. One is labor. So if you look at labor cost for coffee, the historic increase, we've had traveler, even if we budget for it, we've been over the traveler budget significantly year after year. We've made close to $2 million in market adjustment for various positions in the organization, which is both clinical and non-clinical area. We also made some investment in our uh, uh, in a workforce try to grow some of the position within the organization. So with that said, three-year average for that, what, that category of the cost has grown down up about 4.7% for cost. We budgeted in 19 to be 2.5%. The big risk in that budget for 2019 is that try to live with a, uh, a budgeted travel because we know that it's, it hasn't been successful, but there's a lot of initiatives that uh, we are hoping that will uh, will uh, will pay off. On the second bucket, the uh, drug cost. Obviously, drug cost uh, is it's inflation. It's been double digit in the pharmaceutical cost. Oncology is utilization is growing at coffee, and, and and there's a shortage of drugs. Therefore, you have to pay as 
the, you know, what the vendors uh, available. So that growth has been 11% on average for coffee for the last three years. We are budgeting about 28% uh, increase on that, in that category. That's a combination of inflation, which is double digit, plus we are seeing an uptick in our oncology program, which requires us to buy more drugs. Last category here is the supply cost that primarily for us is implant. Has grown about 6.8% combination of price as well as the uh, types of surgery we do, even though we may not increase the surgery at orthopedic, but the service mix has changed, the case mix has changed in that, so we are doing more surgery that requires implants than the previous year. And then in budget, we still have 6.8% in line with the historical uh, increase. This is a snapshot of year-to-date performance for 2018 compared to budget. Uh, we are down about 2.3% NPR, or we are, we are projecting to be down 2.3% in 2018. And, and pretty much utilization has been below some parts of, you know, most parts of the services that we provide. And the expense pressure, obviously, is our expenses are higher. Combination of, as I said, about the travelers and paying for the drugs and, and the mix of their services in our implant team. So that's a problem. So this, at this point, we are seeing a loss of operation about, we're projecting to be about over $2 million for 2018. Okay, just a quick update on our community health needs assessment. We are right at the point with our new community health needs assessment to get board approval next month. We had quorum health resources come in and help facilitate this process. The thing that the staff here is really thankful for is we were part of the, this process with creating our needs assessment. When we came in in 15 and 16, uh, we had a very big learning curve with our, our needs assessment because we weren't part of making the needs assessment. We were just there to implement. And so we, we all said to each other, wow, it was nice that we could be part of putting this together. What Quorum told us, and a couple of the Quorum staff members have uh, years of experience said that they hadn't seen a process quite like the one that we had at Copley. And what they were talking about is the input and the participation from our community. We actually had 78 local uh, experts from the community take part in making this plan and providing feedback. We had two different surveys that went out with over 172 responses. And then we had a two or three hour meeting where we had our first draft of the needs assessment uh, at the table and most of the community members that we know were there. And what we did together is essentially try to figure out where we, where we would put our effort and our resources. Not that we won't focus on other needs, because we certainly will, but as far as our needs assessment, these are the top needs identified. And you can see preventative care and chronic health are from the 2015. I think we all could agree that both are worthy of continuing in our 2018 needs assessment, and then also uh, mental health and substance abuse, something that all the hospitals are, are quite familiar with. Now, some of the things that we're going to do as far as primary and secondary prevention, this is not all inclusive. Certainly, it helps with cost avoidance and bending the cost curve, but most importantly, with the patient being the center of all we do, this helps the keep the patient out of the emergency department, out of our inpatient floor. It helps them to remain healthy and enjoy their life, and that's really our goal. So one of the key things that we found over the last couple of years that we've been trying to work on this is that screening, identifying what the patient needs, and then having and knowing about the resources through adequate case management is really where it's at. And we've seen great success. Lori will talk about it on the next slide. Um, but uh, we're really excited about that. 
One of the other things here that I haven't talked about, um, that I won't talk any more about because it's done in a presentation, and uh, it seems like a small thing, but it, it, it actually is uh, pretty significant. We're putting in our first medication drop box into Copley. And sometimes, you know, change is tough. And some people have some concerns about is somebody going to come in and, and rip it out and take the drop box, which has happened, not in Vermont, but is a possibility. But again, it's about mitigating risk and saying that's pretty low risk. And we want our patients to have a, another place in concert with Sheriff Marcoux and what he's done to be able to drop off their medications and get rid of them the right way. I looked under my, my as we go through this process, there's a lot of regulation that, that takes place in order to get this done, believe it or not. And Meg Morris, our director of the pharmacy, has been great. I think we actually have it at the, at the hospital now. But uh, I was in my bathroom and looking for something under the sink. I realized, gosh, I have over a hundred pills that I've been carrying with me probably my last two army duty stations and just never got rid of because I was like, How, I, I don't want to pour this you know, into the uh, system and into our water. And uh, I think I'll be one of the first persons to partake and use this drop box. This partnership with uh, the Blueprint for Health and uh, Cheslov with a shared position in the emergency department of a social worker is an excellent investment for all of us for health care reform. Many of you in this room may know Dominique. This is a great example of right person in the right role at the right time. And what we believe we've experienced this year in our emergency department is a bit of the Dominique effect. Her commitment to this work of uh, connecting patients, screening for social determinants of health, and getting patients access to care and resources has really uh, propelled us forward, and we've seen a decrease in the ED utilization and volumes. However, 6% of all emergency department patients were screened or evaluated by our ED social worker. 608 total referrals, including 422 unique patients. 157 of those were complex with chronic health conditions and required a face-to-face -face evaluation. 241 patients were successfully connected with primary care and 77 high utilizers, again, chronic conditions, were identified and connected. In the second quarter of FY18, we committed to this position becoming a full-time employee at Copley and created a shared vision to start working towards a second role to support this work, which will be the community referral specialist. The work and learnings related to high utilizers have transferred to acute care inpatient unit where this social worker has identified opportunities to enhance early follow-up and monitoring of our patients after discharge. In FY19, this new shared position, the referral specialist will help us to be better community partners through advanced screening, early intervention, timely follow-up, and more frequent monitoring. Our goals are to get these patients back in the community, do just-in-time care management, specifically where we see our mental health patients, our substance-dependent patients, uh, leaving treatments or acute care settings and coming back, and being able to make that connection with the care management team from those facilities so that we know when they're back in our community and we can be there to give them the phone call and make sure they've got the resources they need. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm not going to go over each of my remaining slides <coughs> in detail, uh, so I'll, I'll pick it up a bit, if that's okay with the, with the board. Yes. So Rise Vermont, two years ago, Jill Barry Bowen, I think she's sitting in the crowd. Jill, uh, thank you for being here. 
I talked to my staff, uh, my senior team, she came to Copley and talked to us about Rise Vermont. Now she's sending me Rise Vermont uh, stuff to wear in the mail. I got something uh, late last week, uh, a cycling jersey, which I'm going to wear in the near future. I think this is a great platform uh, for the ACO and for the hospitals to follow. The big thing for us is it was a, a tad bit of risk where we were not part of the risk hospital pool when we decided to go forward with this program and we're excited to be part of it. I looked at our calendar for this month. We have exercise classes, story time for kids at the library, childbirth education classes, and we're doing some training for the 5K on a regular basis with those that can get out late afternoon and do that. So we're excited about this program. So last year, I talked briefly about our blog that was nationally recognized. It's grown even more. You can see the FY18 results. Uh, 22 households in Lamore County uh, have been touched by the blog or have gone to the blog. You see some of the, the past topics. I specifically enjoyed the, the building, uh, building resilience and hope. We all need resilience. We all need to find ways to uh, cope with, with life itself sometimes because it can be tough. Uh, 753 impressions for our Facebook and uh, Twitter, you can see the numbers. We're, we're excited. Our community is actually excited about this. I've had a few members say, thanks for that article. I said, well, I didn't write the article, but you're, you're welcome um, because it's being read and it's helping us and our community think about ways that we can improve our health and live quality lives. So I, on this slide here, what I really wanted to highlight is the investments, not just in the action grants that we're gonna uh, work with the, the UCC to decide where those dollars would go to, but also on our social worker, uh, our Rise Vermont coordinator, um, our community action grants, as I just talked about, but some of the other things that we've invested in reform, which are not within the parameters necessarily of the guidelines for the 0.4%, but are, are maybe one or two steps away to help us get there in many instances. Um, we, we had Quorum do a wonderful job with our needs assessment. I mean, just, just a terrific job facilitating that. As I said, we're, we're excited. Nesquip is a cost of thousands of dollars yearly to be part of that program, but I think long term, this is the long game, right? I think long term, that's gonna more than pay for itself with all the things we're now learning, which you've heard me talk about three years ago. Of, we think we're good, but we don't really know. And now we're starting to know that, hey, we've got some things to work on, but we overall provide great surgical care, and that Nesquip program is providing that. Shared decision making, not cheap, upfront. There's a huge upfront cost of twenty to thirty thousand dollars. But we felt it was that important to include our patients in the process of deciding what kind of care they should get with their physician or other provider. Uh, and and you heard the results from Adam that he's uh, he's so excited about. And then also on on a yearly basis uh, with our survey company that we work with to to get our patient feedback on how we're providing care to them and then using that feedback to sustain what we're doing and then also improve what we're doing if there are areas of improvement. Um, capital spending for Copley. Uh, for 2019, we have about $3 million capital spending budgeted. Those are primarily routine capital. That's a number that we normally have somewhere that to just routine replacement for equipment. There's not no major item over 500,000. However, for following years, we have planned close to 19 million dollars, and are, that includes both routine replacement of uh, capital spending. Also, there are some placeholders for two major areas. One being electronic medical record. We're still in the process. We have a group that's working on it that will have uh, options laid out for. <coughs> senior management and board members to discuss sometime in fall. And then second group we have that work, uh, 
placeholder, we have the facili facility needs for the organization. Um, that also needs to be part of the planning process. We have some dollars in different buckets in those following years, but we don't have the details yet how, what options we're gonna take because the groups are working on it, what will be the uh, funding source, how we're gonna achieve those investments. But this is just uh, for you guys to see what the future capital needs of company it may look like. Uh, this is a slide was probably the one that took a while to pull together. So uh, it's it's brief, but it's not it's complex at the same time. So in order to figure out what will be a top line growth for copy may look like in the future. Obviously, you need to know what the factors going below the top line. So, top line meaning that I think that uh, section 10 was relating all prayer model of 3.5 percent. I think that was the question that I mean that. Was. So, there are certain parts of these factors are uh, you can quantify to some degree, and others are not. So. So cost pressure, so this is the conversation we just had earlier, what is a cost pressure? So we think for future, we probably need somewhere around three to 5% cost increase. It's different buckets of cost category may be higher, some might be lower, but that's a range we see that based on historically and what we see coming down the path. Second, we need somewhere around two to 4% operating margin to be able to, uh, uh, fund our routine capital spending along with the funded depreciation that we have. Also, start building our cash reserve. As you noticed earlier, we have lost over 40 days of cash on hand last few years. There are, then there are other factors that goes along with knowing what will be the utilization trend for Copley. Copley is one of the counties that population is growing and, and also there's a patient choice, they come for our services, especially for our orthopedic. What will be our service mix? This is very important for small hospitals. Copley Hospital is about 50%, all services use fixed costs, no question about it. But Copley Hospital is about 50% of our business, including downstream revenue, are related to oncology and orthopedic. Obviously, if you have oncology, chemos, you need drugs, which is the variable cost. Obviously, if you have most of the uh, orthopedic procedures that we have requires implant. So we can charge for the chemo and drugs, and we can charge for implant. But that puts a pressure on the cap on the top line, because in order for us to capture those variable costs, we have to get the revenue associated with those variable costs. And that goes against the top line cap. So I just want to make it clear, this is very important. As bigger the hospitals are, this is less important because you can, the law of averages takes over. But in our case, when you have 50% of our business, it is important. Then we also have a major capital investment that we talked about earlier that we need to figure out how we're going to fund. So that has to be factored what the future outlook for company financial is going to be. And obviously, we're going to continue our effort on cost containment because we, we, but the thing is that there's a diminishing value for small hospital to be. We've already put $3 million, we've accomplished 61% of that. We are hoping to get the remaining down, at least most of them done, but we'll continue on that. What we see as the old payer connection is that perhaps as a, on a system level, might be achievable at the state level. And, now, and I think if you look at the budget submission on system level, pretty much comes within the range of the cap that we talked about. However, hospital to hospital becomes case by case needs to be evaluated. There are factors such as utilization trade. Basically, there are the hospital areas that population is shrinking, certain areas growing, Demographics changing. You've got service mix. So obviously, the smaller you are, and you have the services that are high on variable cost, has a pressure. 
size of the organization. Uh, there is a reason there's a critical access hospital designation because there's a huge fixed cost of cost has to be carried to the small hospital. So it's a pressure there as well. Capital need. Not every hospital is on the same capital spending cycle. Every hospital has different parts. So their needs has to be uh, evaluated and uh, reacted to. And also overall health and the financial health of the organization. So, so goal, I think as far as goal came out, I think it's pretty attainable on a high level but might be problematic in, in the individual hospital unless they look at the case factors. Uh, and then uh, historical, uh, yeah, and section 11 we want us to see how we are as far as the compliance with the NPI in our, we look at 16, 17, 18, we were way up on the, in our NPR in 16, 17 pretty much on target. This year we are way below what the target is. So over those three years, we have reduced our rates about 11%, roughly $5 million a year back to the system. Uh, uh, we are exceeded the cap on a combined basis about 400,000, less than 0.2%. Thank you. I've essentially covered everything on this slide, and so I will turn this over to the board. And Thank you, Eric. Let's we'll start with Robin. Thank you. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you for what to me seemed like this year a more balanced presentation between your, your understood focus on surgical procedures and uh, investment and focus on the community as a whole. So I really appreciate that. I particularly appreciate your focus on shared decision making, given that your hospital does have a focus on surgical procedures. That to me seems like a very necessary component. Um, I, I, my first question around the RISE Vermont program is uh, my understanding of how the program works is that there is also some reporting that happens related to, to that one care helps participate in around cost and utilization. And I'm curious if you choose not to join one care next year for at least the Medicaid program, how that will impact your Rise Vermont participation and how you uh, get that data. And you're welcome to follow up if later if that uh, I'll have to say that I don't know the answer to that question. We, we have not crossed that bridge yet, uh, but uh, I think we're going, we're, we'll know what we're going to do in the next couple of weeks, and we can get back to you once we're past that point. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, the other question I had relating to your rate increase is could you talk a little bit about your major commercial payers and are they all uh, reimbursing as a percentage of charges or how does that kind of work with your payer contracts? Um, roughly speaking, uh, half of our business is government payer yep. and the other half is commercial payer. And most of our contracts are percentage of charges for our okay. And Medicare is based on critical access information <coughs> payment. And Medicare is a percentage of ch ch charges, which is, you know, it's very significant. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and then my last, I have two more quick questions. One is that um, in, uh, the, we get a chart that talks about areas of utilization that uh, vary from year to year, and I was noticing that your physician office visits from your 18 budget to 18 projected were down a little over 25%, but I didn't specifically notice a, a description of that in your utilization um, narrative on page 10 of your narrative. Could you talk a little bit about uh, how that interacts? Absolutely. Uh I think if you look at it and go beyond, even when you go past, there are, I think we maybe discussed it last year, was that we had a, a hospital-based urology practice that went on, on the 
hybrid, so we normally was counted in that position. Yeah. Then and then this year, I think over there we had sleep clinic that no longer done a copy, so that would be impacted. We had some subspecialists that was coming to the copy. We are we lost those as well, so those are not major procedure driven, but those are what used to be counted in the hospital as a physician visit is no longer being counted. But there is an effort that's going on, primarily telemedicine, that we try to substitute the, those subspecialties that are So there is that effort on the, on the way. But what you see is basically going from in-hospital practice <coughs> to outside hospital, either by other hospitals or to go to private practice. Thank you. And, and then lastly, um, in your Healthy Vermonters 2020 profile for your county, um, I noticed that there was just a, a strangely high rate for new cases of end-stage end renal disease per million population in the 500s as opposed to the statewide average of 188. And, and that could be a data issue, I don't know, but I just wanted to ask about that because it was such an outlier. And you, again, if you need to get back to me, that's totally fine. Yeah. I don't uh, personally have any uh, information on it, but maybe you can give me a reference. I can try to uh, dig it up and speak to some of the uh, your old, uh, nephrology colleagues. That would be, that'd be great. It's yep. the Healthy Vermonters 2020 profile that's done by the uh, Department of Health, and we can send you a link, although I'm sure you can find it easily. As well. Yeah, no, I will dig it up. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Tom. <coughs> thank you, and again, uh, thank you for uh, hosting where we're here tonight. Lunch. I will, um, Thank you for coming. <laughs> it was healthy. <laughs> Listening and eating on healthy lunch are sometimes not that compatible, but <laughs> it, it was nice to see your facility. Um, I have uh, uh, two or three questions here. One is uh, I see you as, as in kind of a mini version of what we went through with Gifford, which is looking for 2019 to be a year to get back on track, uh, so to speak. And so you're uh, kind of looking to increase revenues um, at a rate higher than trend um, uh, at, a, a, at over 8% and uh, squeeze expenses uh, below trend, um, which the trend was 4.72 since 2015, uh, to 2.8% and then kind of flip the bottom line from a, a $1.8 million loss uh, to a $1.8 million uh, excess in revenues. Um, and I note on the revenue side uh, that you're looking for um, a rate increase that will yield you about 3.1 million. Um, and, uh, and that all comes on the commercial side. Uh, there's no rate increase associated with um, Medicaid or Medicare. And so <clears throat> the, rate, the commercial rate increase uh, combined would be 11.3% and your Medicaid increase would be 3.3% your Medicare uh, increase would be 6%. So um, is it fair to assume that that 6% increase in Medicare will be associated with, um, <clears throat> with the fact that you're uh, an access hospital? Um, and, uh, I'm yes, talking. basically the way it works is that uh, they pay us based on uh, allowable costs, 101% one, uh, of allowable costs. So certain costs are deducted because they don't recognize those costs, and there are certain costs that there is a cap, but ultimately it's based on the cost. So it's, uh, we had those areas that when we had no volume, we got less money from Medicare because your unit cost drops, therefore you get less money. So and the utilization is down, and your cost is not down, you get more money. So that's why you see that $2 million in our reimbursements kind of like that. There's some other pieces there, but that majority is the case of the Medicare. So, so the, the, the 6 percent Medicare is a combination of utilization um, and, and cost. And, and, and cost. And Medicaid, what, what, what's behind your assumption about a uh, 3 percent increase in Medicaid revenue? Well, uh, we put some 2 percent increase in there because I think there was some discussion at some point that they may increase that. That was a combination of, I believe, uh, for utilization and cost. I think that was the back in there, and we use it as a number, and there's other stuff that goes back up. Thank you. Um, I know uh, 
in a number of instances to mention, and in your presentation to mention of travelers. Um, and clearly, uh, I've come to learn that travelers are about two x times the cost of, of, of having a, 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 a staff member on board. So I'm looking at the uh, utilization data in the budget presentation, and it had uh, travelers for um, uh, twenty uh, for uh, budgeted for 2018 at 10, um, and for 20, but you're out, you're running at about a 14 run rate, and then hoping your budget for 2019 to get back to 10 again. And I, I'm just, I, but I couldn't find any uh, uh, in the documents any. Uh, financials associated with that, and uh, my sense is it's probably a big number with your travelers up at that level. So, um, you know, that that's my question: is that if you're looking for savings out of travelers in 2019, which I think was the presentation, but you have the same number of travelers budgeted in 2019 as you had for 2018, uh, I'm, I'm looking for the savings. What? 2018. If you do a budget to budget comparison, which is uh, this uh, variance talks about, if you look at what we budgeted in for 18 for traveler, what we budgeted for 19, I don't think there's any increase. So basically, we are seeing more in projected line for travelers than we budgeted. Therefore, we are working at least to get that. In to budget, budget. but to the budget level. So that's why you won't be able to see, since all the comparisons done budget to budget, you won't be able to see that savings according. But the budget budget is basically a budget. Basically, yeah. Okay. Um, a few more quick questions here. Um, you said during your uh, presentation that I, I think you called in your procedures room are running at right. 100%. So, so there's, does that mean that there's no more upside associated with them? Tom, when you say upside, are you saying is there is there that, that there's no additional capacity that, that you can use to bring in more revenue? So first of all, I I want to just step back and say that a hundred percent in ORs and procedure rooms is is more of a percentage um, in the high sixties, low seventies, and so uh, I don't we don't have our our high-speed director of the surgical center here. She's out of, out of country. Um, but what we have preliminary starting in a couple of weeks is essentially utilization in, in that ballpark for both our three ORs and one uh, procedure room. And from a, a person perspective, when you have physicians and other uh, providers, uh, surgeons and other types of uh, specialties that have been practicing for decades um, one way, in other words, they, they had the procedure room three days every week for years uh, because there were no other physicians that needed that space. And why I say this is a monumental change is we're, we're changing those habits, not that they're bad habits or behaviors, but we're changing those behaviors to allow a number of the procedures that are currently in the ORs go to the procedure room to open up more space in the surgical center, the three ORs, where those cases need to be. So basically, we want the cases at the level that they should be at, either the procedure room or the ORs. And what's happening is we uh, Joe McLaughlin, Dr. McLaughlin is our hand surgeon. He can do uh, a lot of his cases in the procedure room. It's just as safe. It's the right place to do it. He's willing to do it. And what that does is it opens up space for our new foot and ankle surgeon that didn't have OR time. So everybody that needs OR time and the amount of days that they truly need will have it starting in, in September. You know, give or take, we, we'll see, we'll assess and make adjustments, um, but that's, it's a good news story, right? Because we're being efficient as possible, but our physicians and our nurses and our other staff really have had to make some changes 
um, to how they work each and every day uh, for the betterment of Copley and our patients. And finally, just a quick one. Um, I know that you initiated a 340B program, um, but in your budget document, there's no revenue um, on your income statement associated with that. And so I'm just wondering if maybe, not now, but at some point you can just give us a uh, uh, we don't have detail, uh, we don't have retail pharmacy in our at Copley. So there is a difference between we just do inpatient. So there are hospitals that they have retail pharmacy and they do show some three forty point savings that will be under their other revenue. And because uh, that's one hundred and seventy thousand. No, in our case, that's one hundred seventy thousand cost costs. Okay. Not the revenue. So so revenue stays the same. But you buy the drugs cheaper, therefore that, that's the savings comes from. But there are hospitals that you probably referring to that they have other revenue in there, in, and that re relates to pretty much to the retail side of the pharmacy that you you won't ca count as a patient revenue. It will be other revenue. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you mind if I add just a little quick thought? Yeah, sorry. So Deborah, I think you know the director of the cycle. Um, in our community, our local FQHC has a 340B full 340B program, and so the members of our community are able to access those cheaper drugs at the pharmacy through through their primary care practices. And we don't have primary care coupling. We've actually looked at um, the possibility of, of doing the retail side of the 340B program twice. I think actually in our in our last five years, and we don't attribute enough volume for any of those vendors to think that that's something that is viable for us. But fortunately, at least for our community. You know, they're going through the RFQHC to get those savings. So, that, clear that. Hey, Marie. Uh, yeah, you want to talk a little bit about your cost structure relative to your revenue? And really looking, you know, kind of, I'm going to start in 2016, 17, and 18. And the concern is in 2016, you exceeded your top line um, from your forecast by a little over a million, but on the bottom line, you missed by a million. And you were negative 872 in um, non operating, I'm sorry, in operating revenue. In 17, you slightly exceeded your top line, but again, missed the bottom line by about 600,000. And now in 18, you're missing your top line by about 1.6 million, but missing the bottom line by over 2.3 million. So, you know, the trend keeps. You know, concerned about your balance sheet is, is weakening, your cash position is weakening. But when you look at your forecast now for 2019, there still seems to be some optimism on the top line to grow off of the, where you're currently trending at 8.5%, and a real reliance on rate at an 8% rate increase to, to potentially turn around to a million five in operating profit. Um, there seems to be, A, a lot of risk in that, and again, the reliance on an 8% rate increase, where it seems you really need to look at your entire cost structure and, and be shifting away from, you know, I know you talked about about 50% of your revenue comes from the orthopedic and oncology. What's been going on with the rest of the revenue in the past three years? And you know where do you see that going forward? Because it's just you know it's not sustainable how you're running it now. But I don't think it's also going to be sustainable to expect to get you know an eight percent rate increase. And I'm also concerned if I look back at 18 specifically, your budget request when you came in was for over seven percent. I think a three uh, zero percent rate increase. And it was knocked down to a 5% revenue and a negative 3.5% rate increase. And you're not even getting there, you're at 2.2%. So I'm a little concerned a couple of things. One, you're probably, you may be doing yourself a disservice in saying that you need an 8.5% increase on, to, on your top line, um, because I don't know that you're necessarily gonna get that. And again, the reliance on the 8% in rate, where it may need to be the cost structure, we need more cost savings, you know, because I look at, you know, if you could get another 700000 in cost savings, that's going to be 2% rate. You know, just, just, I guess if you could talk about the financial strength of the shift in there. Absolutely. Uh, I think what makes it hard 
because I think they are kind of unique hospital that I know where you are going with that conversation because you got you got the areas that perhaps is not growing or volume wise, which primarily uses a fixed cost. Then we have areas that growing besides using the fixed fixed cost, also using a variable cost. So for example, so we have you know 25 bed hospitals, so we kind of staff accordingly. So if we need on the medical side, you know, those are fixed costs. So if you need a traveler in order to provide that care on our that side of the our, our service line, we have to accommodate that. So that's kind of puts the pressure on the fixed side of the cost that we are strong. Then we have an area that it's 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 growing and every time we do more orthopedic surgery, we have to do buy more implant. Every time we do more oncology, we have to buy drugs. So we are in that it's fifty percent of our business, it's a unique situation. I absolutely get what you are saying, and that's what the challenging part, what the outlook, financial outlook may look for the hospital outside. And only area, because we did look at possibly, you know, reducing the services, but it's not enough to reduce services that you can really reduce the fixed cost. And if you want to reduce the services, it has a variable cost, but that's in people coming for that services, right? because we have backlog for the services that it has a high variable cost, meaning orthopedic. So, so if we had to choose, let's say, cost saving associated with maybe uh, reducing the services in some part, then you have to offset that uh, fixed cost with a rate increase that because you don't have the revenue associated with that volume that you will have. So it's a, I'm not quite sure if I articulate what you're looking for, but that's basically what our challenge is. So we have a combination of the service line. I mean, for small hospitals especially, you know, you've got half of your business grows on both fixed cost usage in, as well as variable cost. It's a pressure on that. That's what you see on this year, for example, our surgery on orthopedic is, is doing fine, but other parts of the hospital is not doing as well as far as inpatient stay. But that cost of implant is not going down, but the fixed cost it is what it is for the hospital outside. So that's, that's a challenge. So it's, it's, I absolutely understand what you're saying. And we are trying, unless we do something with our variable side of our business, there's a minimal staffing that we have to do in certain parts of our business. You know, we have the MRI tech, regardless if you do eight or nine or 10, you have to have an MRI tech. And you have two nurses in an obstetric. Regardless of how many babies go in there, you have to have two nurses around the clock. So it, it's, it's a complex, and I try to make that page. That's why I say that page looks simple, at the same time very complex, and that's why it makes sense to look at the hospitals case by case, understand the full picture of the service is that we provide, and, and that's what I'm saying. Just if the like, utilization is going down this year, you're saying, and potentially next year, although it may not be if you bridge it off your current forecast versus right now you're bridging off the budget so, that's too high. Absolutely. I think what happened in 2018 is that we always use the three uh, year of moving average for our utilization. So we, we since we've been going up, we try not to exceed the NPR again, so we may have been overshoot that utilization more than we normally do. Second piece was that we had a new, uh, uh, new physician come on board, and we projected faster than they could ramp up, and that's one of the reasons I think Arthur was describing, looking at block time. We had the physicians on board, but not necessarily have the block time for those physician to be able to use our OR and procedure rooms. So, so that's combination. And then 2019, we are going back to uh, using three-year average for our utilization. We also had significant uh, amount of discussion with our uh, director of uh, our orthopedic as well as uh, uh, OR to make sure that, uh, to validate all of those procedures for different specialties that we have. So we're making sure that our 2019 volume as solid as possible. But only see on 2019 that I earlier I mentioned was perhaps our labor cost, our travel, because we're still budgeting 
pretty much flat budget from 18 to 19, and we still see the pressure that we may be traveling. But you are working hard enough to use it as more than much. Yeah. Hey, Jess. Hey. Hello, all. How are you? Good. How are you? How are you? Yeah. Um, so I'll preface all that I'm about to say with uh, genuinely wanting to see Copley succeed. I really do. Um, and I want you to continue to provide high quality, affordable care to your community. I think you have an incredibly engaged community. And I want you to be financially strong. And I, too, worry about your case cash on hand um, and some of, the, some of the trends we're seeing. Um, but I really do appreciate all the efforts you're doing and shared decision making as to the quality initiatives and real that you're thinking about Medicaid for the welfare model. And these are all really great things that I'm hearing. Here's my conundrum, and I'm sure you're not surprised by my conundrum. So sorry. I'm sure I'm not. I'm sure you're not. All right, this is our annual dance, but That's let's, right. let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. So <laughs> last year. Really oh, yeah. That would be good. Yeah. You would like that, wouldn't you? I told you. All right. So, um, so last year, you know, if my memory serves, and it may not, but you know, the to to get Copley into compliance with NPR and with CON uh, promises that were made, it was about a three point three million dollar overage that would have required a six point eight percent rate reduction, right? And the board decided actually not to impose a 6.8% rate reduction, but instead to cut that in half and impose a 3.4% rate reduction with the idea that the new leadership team, you know, come into compliance over two years, uh, cut costs, get expenses under control. And the idea was that let, you know, Copley go over in 2018 and then by 2019 be more like coming in under uh, the, the budget guidance so that over the two year period we're all in compliance. <coughs> And in the end, I think as Maureen said, we allowed a 5.6% increase in NPR, which was the highest of any hospital and really still exceeded our target, as I said. And so this year, I was genuinely surprised to see, you know, with our hospital budget guidance of a 2.8%, 0.4% HRIs, form investments, to see and ask for 5.9% in NPR with an 8% commercial rate increase. <coughs> And in terms of um, you know the health reform investments, it was only about 0.1 percent you know of that NPR was for health reform investments. A little surprising too, because as I look at where the hospital service area that you're in, so not Copley in particular, but the hospital service area that you're in, a lot of those all payer model metrics actually for that service area were below the targets more than some of the many other hospitals. So I thought, well, there needs to be more improvement on health reform, and we're not seeing a lot of it with a big ask. Uh, and so I fully understand that Copley needs to get a positive margin, and, I, and I, I fully appreciate that, and I agree with that. But I'm not convinced, and I want to explore with you other ways to get to that positive margin uh, in light of declining utilization that doesn't necessarily ask commercial rate payers to pay 8% more. Um, and so the way I look at it is, well, we can look at either increasing revenue or decreasing costs. So if we start thinking about the increasing revenue side, I was surprised, and actually this part of my question was answered by Tom's question, but I looked through and Copley and Springfield are the only two hospitals that don't report any 340B revenue, um, which surprised me, actually, to realize there are only two hospitals because I realized there was a retail pharmacy component to it. Uh, but that's millions of dollars that other hospitals are getting that you're not getting. And I guess I would just, I'm going to go through my list and you can answer the ones who will go through my list, but is there opportunity to explore that retail pharmacy piece again, given that it seems to me that there are other hospitals are benefiting an order of magnitude of millions of dollars um, on that 340B side. The other piece that I noticed on the revenue side is most other hospitals seem to have some grant income. And I look through and not a, actually zero grant income coming in to Copley over the past few years. And it's not a lot of money, but you know, some hospitals, Brattleboro is a million dollars, Mount Scotney 540, North Country 175. I mean, it's just, it is money coming in. Uh, to the extent that it offsets commercial rate increases would be really helpful. So on the revenue side, I'm thinking more grants and what is the possibility with 340B? When we go to the expense side, we've been talking about expenses for a while, and I do appreciate the cost reductions that you know your team has undertaken in the past year or so. 
but I still look at you know some things that were red flags to me. So, for example, your cost per adjusted admission is the highest of any hospital presenting today. But you know, so it's thirteen thousand nine hundred. Giffords is ten thousand. North Country is ten thousand. So Northeast is twelve thousand seven hundred. So still significantly high cost per adjusted admission. Your FTE per adjusted occupied, occupied bed is 10, the state average is six. So I'm thinking about labor. Do you, you know, is that a reasonable FTE count when the rest of the state seems to be managing it at six and you're at 10? So is that, I don't know, but is that a, a, a place where there could be some movement? Your utilization is falling. You're projecting fewer admissions, shorter lengths of stay, fewer OR visits, fewer ED visits. Yet, you know, we're seeing these supply costs and these drug costs that are really high, and these increases are higher than we're seeing from other hospitals. So I'm wondering, you know, if, are there opportunities here for you know, supply chain management improvements or getting into some consortium of buying, affiliate, you know, uh, associating with some other buying group, things, like purchasing groups? Because those increases also seem high. And then the last one that really struck me was your marketing budget. So your marketing budget is about $437,000. To put that into perspective, when I tried to look at other hospitals, Porter allocated $36,000, uh, Northeast allocated $55,000, North Country is $132,000, Brattleboro is $75,000, and Gifford is zero. So your marketing budget is extremely high relative to other hospitals I've put in your size. Um, so that seems to be another place to, to be looking. So I guess my overall question is, what can you do on the revenue side with respect to the two things that I mentioned? And then can you help me understand why the cost per adjusted admission is so high, the FTE per adjusted bed is high, your, your you know, uh, drug costs are rising while utilization is falling, and why your marketing budget seems out of line with other hospitals in your peer group, I would say. A lot of questions, I am. I figured I'd throw them all out at you and it's all good. Um, Thank you. Yeah. On the revenue side, just a brief thing. Uh, first of all, uh, they may have a millions of dollars in the revenue on the post before the read, but if we do go down that road, if there is a possibility, you would have a cost associated with that as well. So, so there's, so that revenue line that you see is not net of cost. So just food for thought. Uh, second thing is that. We do have a, we do have a copy uh, we do have grants, but it, it comes through copy system. It's a parent organization. Normally, probably runs around fifty to hundred thousand dollar range. The problem with the grant is that you have a revenue associated grant. You also have expense going along with that grant. You get grant, but you have to spend that dollar for the grant purposes. So, you, as far as the bottom line of that goes, will be zero because you show as a revenue let's say $50,000, and what you are going to spend that grant will be a $50,000. So, so I'm, I, so. Well, couldn't it offset some other expenditures elsewhere that would have shown Well, if the grant potentially offsets something else, but most likely most of the grant is for new initiatives that you have to have, or the donors that sometimes they restrict for certain things, so not for routine operations. So if you have a, you have a routine operation that's supported by grant, of course you can get more revenue, but most of the time grants we have for a specific purpose, emergency preparedness grant, to quality improvement plan, uh, different things that there's a cost associated with it. So there's a net impact in the operating margin pretty much non-existent. So that's on the revenue side. Uh, on the cost per adjusted admission and FTEs, uh, I wish for small hospitals there was adjusted for the service mix because if, if, if my services that I can provide a copy primarily about medical cases, we probably won't have the compensation we are having today as far as cost per admission goes. We probably won't have the conversation about the FTEs because the complexity of care, taking care of the surgery, after therapists, you know, you have to have certain level of nurses, different kind of specialty. So by not adjusting for, as I said, the big hospital may not have, be important, but a small hospital, not adjusting for that kind of severe 
service makes uh, uh, discrepancy among small hospitals makes a big difference on on those calculations. So it, it, uh, so if I'm adding the cost of the oncology to cost for just admission, and if I didn't have oncology programs, trust me, they, those costs won't be there. If I didn't have orthopedic service, we won't have implant costs associated going to that calculation. So, so that's why it's important to dive down by service line some of those metrics to especially the small hospital because there's just wide range of types of services makes a big difference in those calculations. Marketing? Marketing? Marketing that happened. Well that's certainly not me, but um, well, I'm going to follow the guidance that I gave to my staff. I, I don't necessarily uh, know the answer to that question uh, because I can't compare us uh, to the other hospitals and what they, uh, you know, the cost of what they are doing versus what they're not. So I'll, I'll have to get back to you on that and, and talk to my, my marketing folks. Okay. One other actual question with that. I noticed that, um, you know, one of the expense lines is four to seven percent inflationary adjusted for adjustment for health insurance for your employees and uh, so I'm assuming are you self-insured yes so has there been any consideration of talking to your carrier or your uh, TPA about uh, attributing those lives to one care and getting under a self-insured attribution through, <coughs> through your carrier we have not at this point So a couple quick questions. Uh, first one is for Adam and Don. Uh, you talked about the 107 days for the first appointment on cardiology. At one of our traveling board meetings, we heard from another hospital that in addition to um, experiencing wait times for um, mental health related issues, they've also experienced wait times in referring um, patients to tertiary hospitals on, on cardio. Have you experienced that same? thing at uh, Copley? Yeah, it's hard to get into to see specialists almost everywhere in Vermont, and cardiology is no exception. What really happens, of course, is people who are really sick get seen, they get double booked, they get overbooked, they uh, get added on. Uh, but I think this is, what you're seeing is a reflection of the increasing complexity of medicine. Back 20 years ago, when I was in primary care, I could take care of a lot of these problems by myself. I didn't need the cardiologist. And now I'm taking care of diseases and treatments, and the primary care doctors have much less familiarity with them. So it's a comp combination of the increased uh, complexity of care procedures that were never invented before, like aortic valve replacement uh, without open heart surgery, uh, and of course the uh, demographic shift uh, as well. And there's, uh, if you, you know, I work with the cardiology fellows at UVM. None of them are interested in uh, rural cardiology. So it's a combination of factors that's, I think, putting pressure on all the hospitals, both uh, within the university and outside the university. So, Adam, what I really was trying to get to is when the patient really needs to be sent to that tertiary hospital, are you experiencing any, any uh, problem with getting them there then? Right. Well, cardiology is usually emergencies, frankly. So they, they get in the door. Something like an ENT evaluation, you know, that could potentially wait for weeks or months is sitting, but cardiology is a little bit different. Uh, we get them in the door because it's an emergency. Okay, great. Okay, uh, I'll just ask one more because I see we're really way behind on time. But our um, last year there was some discussion about moving lab from um, the hospital to the FQAC. Did you proceed with that plan? Actually, that, uh, that did not happen. That was a, a tentative plan, and, and I can't really speak to the FQHC side on uh, their building, their new building, and uh, what they were planning to do. But I can tell you this, we, we've already met uh, with their interim leadership, and what we're looking to do, I'm not sure how they're exactly gonna move forward, but one thing that we're trying to do, which I think both sides are excited about, is we are planning to send, help oh, me out, a phlebotomist over across the street uh, to do the phlebotomy work over there so patients aren't having to cross the street. Now, to you and me, that 50 yards is, is nothing. But to a lot of our patients, that's a big deal. 
And so it's a, it's a small it's a small thing. We're already doing the work, but why not uh, bring the work to where it actually needs to be? So that's all I can tell you right now. Okay, Pat. Thank you. Um, the board has addressed most of my financial questions, but I do have one observation. Um, on your slide six, where you highlight performance on quality measures. I just want to point out that a higher number is better for the number per 10,000 population accessing medication assisted treatment. We're really looking to get people into treatment. So um, your county actually exceeds um, both the APM target and the um, statewide rate. So I just want to Thank you. Thank you, Pat. At this time, we'll turn it over to Julia and Eric from Healthcare Advocates. Hi, my name is Julia Deshaun with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, which is part of the Vermont Legal Aid. Uh, so, our office advocates for Vermonters in healthcare policy reforms and also uh, we serve Vermonters who have issues accessing healthcare um, in the future. Um, so, we hear regularly from people who can't afford the care they need. And um, we're wondering if you agree that affordable healthcare is a major challenge for Vermonters. Oh, did you say affordable? Yeah, healthcare healthcare is a major challenge for Vermonters and New York State. I think uh, it, it's a it's a challenge uh, throughout the country, and it's something that we've been talking about for years. So uh, absolutely, we we feel it's a challenge. I think if. Uh, you look at uh, our mission, that's one thing that we, we're very proud of is uh, the fact that we care for everybody regardless of their ability to pay. And our charity care is a, a fairly robust uh, program and uh, that's something that, uh, that, that uh, we're glad that we can do. So um, I'm wondering if you can describe some of the affordability challenges faced by patients. Sure. Um, I see it every day, and uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, pharmacy costs, and when you choose a drug, uh, you have to take the patient's insurance into account, which is frankly awkward. Patients who have um, the bronze plan, oftentimes they'll want to lump all their expenses into one calendar year, and that includes planning for elective surgery, so they're all clumped into one year. Um, we. Uh, for example, I, uh, the medical director of cardiac rehab, and we found out that having every cardiac rehab patient go to the financial office, we cut their co-pays in half because many of them qualify for uh, free or reduced care. So I think it takes a lot of time. It's a very uh, awkward discussion sometimes because you just want to give the right care to the patient. But we do have the good resources available to us to you know, try to get the best of the situation. But it, it, it's it's. If you sit in my office for an afternoon, you'll, you'll, those cost conversations are coming up uh, all the time. And it, it, I don't have a great solution to it. We, we work with the system that we have. We do the best we can. Thank you. Um, so um, hospitals often qualify free care as something that's provided to patients who can't pay, and then bad debt is qualified as um, money that's not collected from patients who could pay but choose not to. I'm wondering if you agree with that characterization. Yeah, we, we truly encourage people to, you know, for financial assistance, some people, you know, take our approach and some people really have that. They really are proud people and they really want to pay their bills. But, they, but we encourage them to, because at the end of the day, I prefer my staff in billing to not to chase the dollars that people cannot really afford to pay and go after the, you know, bail, people that, that could potentially pay you to pay. So we encourage people really to look at our financial system policy and, and we and we'll meet, we have a financial counselor that meets in the office and people that are willing to do that. And we have, across the hospitals, we probably have one of the generous, you know, somewhere around, people up to 400% uh, of the uh, federal poverty uh, income guideline, they could get some sort of uh, reduced uh, uh, payment, I mean, uh, 
discount from us, so it depends on the people. So, so but we, but people they don't pay, we, we do follow them, we do a credit report if we have to, to collect on them, so, so we go as far as we could, because Medicare also wants us to do that, because they don't want sitting the money to be left on the table. So that's part of the requirement, we have to do a due diligence to collect. How do you assess reminders of ability to pay when setting your prices for different services? Well, I think we, as I said in my presentation about Copley, it's uh, when you look at price setting, when you look at top line growth, it's basically a combination of revenue and the price. Uh, we have to look at what our cost structure is. So if you look at our Margin, so we are putting putting we need the revenue, and if you even though we have price increase of almost eight percent that was mentioned, you have to put in the context that we had eleven plus percent reduction last two years. So so we really have reduced our rate over three percent last five years clinically. So we need done our piece because that eleven percent reduction counted for five million dollars that okay, went from Copley to the system as a as a, as a discount. So so we did as much as we could. Our balance sheet doesn't show it. Of course, it, it did not hurt in process, but it, taking those reduction. But we did our piece to give back to the rate payers indirectly by reducing our rates in the previous years. And combining with the increase that's coming up, we still will be on the negative side compared to the state average. Uh, when the board gives you a approved commercial rate in your budget order, do you see that as a or as a set rate that you'll apply across the rate that we get increased is not necessarily the amount we're going to collect. So, so basically that rate goes in that. And also, NPR is not just a rate, how much we're going to collect, because we also have a huge risk making sure those patients come through the door. At the end of the day, utilization is a big piece as well. So, and this year, the utilization is down. And, and then we also have a certain year of price reduction that we gave back. So we gave back the cert Basically, the rate is more certain than the utilization. So last three years, we had a certain year of rate reduction. And the whole part, we have utilization and we didn't work out currently. So next year, we have, we have a little bit less utilization, but the rate is increased. In, in overall, it's still the reduction. So when you so say the board approved to the seven Do you, at that point, then negotiate with the private insurance companies, or do you just apply that rate and expect that the insurers will pay that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the end of that, and expect what? Expect, expect that the insurers will pay that rate. Thanks. Insurance, not necessarily pay that rate, because we just apply to our prices. Right. So, so that we get the prices. Right. When, when, when we do negotiate with our payers, we are negotiating a discount from our, our charges. So we are not like a big enough to have a fixed payment method. So most of our, so we apply that rate across our business, and then based on the insurance company, what the discount rate is, the discount applies to that. So that's why 7.9% uh, price increase translates somewhere of 5.9% uh, NPR, because you lose some of that increase along with the discount that you give back to the payers. So um, we've heard from a few people in your community that Copley has um, either not allowed providers to provide MIT or not encouraged providers to provide MIT. Um, I'm wondering if that's an accurate characterization and if you can just describe your, um, that dynamic. So let me just make sure that I'm clear that on what you're asking. So you're saying that a couple community members in, in Lamar County said that we would not allow providers to become MAT providers. Right. But that's absolutely untrue. Okay. I, I actually will, will tell you uh, against uh, uh, a number of uh, staff recommending otherwise, uh, I was truly considering a specialty provider, uh, non-primary care provider, uh, to become an MAT certified and provide that care in our building because uh, I believe it, it works and I was willing to do that 
Um, and then uh, that, that provider did, decided to go private as, as a provider. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about uh, what harm reduction services are available in New York community to minimize risk for people who are actively using those things like syringes, gene, and or um, organ distribution. So, we are currently working with the state uh, regulations around pharmacy and our licensure for an organ distribution from our emergency department and working with our uh, providers uh, to see if we can provide that service, how it would look, and, and how we would educate uh, the, the patients in time of discharge to ensure safe uh, usage and, and get it out in the community. Um, we partnered with the community programs to support needle exchange in our community. Uh, and are working to, to bring that service in as well. And our Dropbox that we are putting in and waiting to do our rollout and implementation on that uh, this fall is coming as well. Oh, so I just have one final question. Sorry, did you want to speak to that as well? I, I did, but I can talk to you no, more. No. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> you, saw, you saw it on my face. <laughs> In addition to, to those uh, things that Lori just talked about, you know, Don Dupuy, one of uh, his roles uh, has been to work collaboratively uh, with uh, primary care, Sheriff Maku. They meet on a regular basis to talk about ways that we can better combat what you're talking about. But uh, another thing that I think is very worthy uh, of discussion, or at least letting you know, is um, we uh, have done train the trainer program for de-escalation, which you're gonna often deal with, right, with mental health patients, with uh, patients coming in on uh, certain types of, med uh, of drugs. Uh, we send 10 people uh, to Burlington to get that, to become certified for that de-escalation training, <coughs> which they are bringing back, and we're looking to try to get everybody trained by the end of this year. I may have made that too lofty of a goal, but basically we have 10 people geographically throughout the hospital that are gonna train their folks. So everybody at Copley is trained on how to help people not harm themselves. And I just have one final question that's uh, kind of a clarifying question. And, um, so you responded in part in answer to one of Jessica Holman's questions, but um, my understanding was that your um, FTEs per adjusted bed has increased over the past few years, so is, and you responded that it's due to your service mix. So has your service mix changed over those years and that's caused the increase? Um, yeah, definitely. I think that's part of the, I think the inpatient stays down, you know, the less medical cases than we budgeted than we assumed. So there's, there's different level of, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, clinicians are sitting around me, so when we go through the budget process, we, we stress on FTEs and I, you know, therapists you need types of, uh, uh, you know, when you have a, when you have orthopedic surgery in OR, you probably need a radiology radio tech in the room as well. So you, so there's a lot of pieces there that it's very complex that it's above my level of thing, and I know enough to be dangerous, but there's a lot of more staff and needs to, Changes with that kind of services with the purely just medical cases on the low queue. So that's why it's important some of those metrics should be service mix adjusted, should be acuity adjusted, it should be adjusted by you know size of the hospital. I mean, all of that stuff matters in the following one. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this point, we'll open it up to the public for any comments or questions. Uh, Hamilton, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is sort of a question and a comment. Uh, in, I'm sorry, what in, was your uh, name, sir? My name, is, my name is Hamilton Davis. Oh, thank you. Um, the, uh, in slide five, um, they talk, they're talking about uh, quality measures, and they talk about the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, and it seems that both Drs. Dupuy and Kunin are very interested in that. So my question is this. Um, the um, in the uh, all payer in the uh, one care quality measures they look at they look at readmission to the hospital, but in Vermont, which has 
two heavy, two uh, tertiary centers, but then 12 smaller hospitals. The, it seems to me that one of the most important quality measures is not readmission to the hospital, but, but revision surgery. That is to say, surgery fails in one place, and they go to another place to get it fixed, okay? And my question is, and this is not any kind of a knock on, uh, this is not any kind of a knock on uh, Mansfield Orthopedics. It's one of the, uh, I've got in, anecdotal information about all kinds of places, but not none from there. So, but I'm very curious whether A, uh, doctors Dupuy and Cunin agree that that is a, a, an important issue, number one. Number two, do they think they can do it and do they think it should be done across the state? So I guess the answer to the first part is that, yeah, absolutely, a uh, return to the operating room is important really no matter what hospital uh, it's happening in. And yeah, that is absolutely tracked as well. So that, that, doesn't, that doesn't escape us. As to whether a particular type of revision surgery is done by a particular surgeon or practice, that's really made as a uh, on an ad hoc basis, and it's highly dependent on the specific doctor. And uh, I, I don't want to speak to the, the orthopedists; they can speak themselves. But, but I do a great, great deal of, of hernias, and I have a lot of experience with revision hernias. So it would be unusual for me to refer uh, what I would consider a standard revision to someone else because they're in perfectly good hands at coffee. That's not my question. Okay. My question is this: Let's say a let's say that a hip person has a hip replacement at a small at a community hospital. The the surgery fails. The likelihood is, the likelihood is, in my experience, that that person is not going to get a, re, a redo of the surgery in that hospital. That person is going to go to another hospital, almost certainly, not definitely, almost certainly an academic medical center. And not only that. They can switch between academic medical centers. I've seen that too. You get something failed at UVM, goes to Dartmouth, fails at Dartmouth, goes to UVM. So my question is, that seems to be a huge quality marker in our system. And I don't think we're planning to collect it at this point. And so my question for you and, and Adam is, do you think it ought to be collected? I, I, I believe it is collected. Matter, matter of fact, I'm, I'm quite sure. It, yes, it's collected. It is collected. Yes, sir. Uh, it, it, somebody's going to tell one care about that because they haven't heard it. I'd also like to address that question. I'm sorry, sir. What was your name? John Macy. Thank you. Director of Orthopedics. We do a lot of revision surgery at Copley Hospital. We do a lot of revision joint replacement surgery, and it's actually the opposite of what you speak of. We take care of our own revisions. We take care of revision surgery from all around the state. Burlington and Dartmouth folks come to us for revision surgery. Well, if you heard my caveat, I said what I was speaking about had nothing to do with Mansfield Orthopedics. I understand that. What I'm talking about is other community hospitals. I mean, if you think yes. that that kind of revision surgery isn't going on a lot, then you're making a mistake. It is going on, and we are seeing it, and I would agree with you. So all I'm saying is it should be collected. I think we are. I, I can't, you know, I, I can't speak to the other hospitals, uh, nor, nor would I want to. But uh, that's my question. I, you, you're doing revision surgery. You're one of the sources, I, and I don't doubt that. All I'm saying is that if you've got somebody doing in some hospital that's getting a lot of revision surgeries that have to be redone, okay, that's a quality problem. Do you disagree with that? No, I, I'd agree, and, well, I'd, and that's why we track it. <laughs> okay, any other public comments or questions? Dale. This, I think, is just a clarification question. I did not hear them mention having workforce issues, which I thought was kind of curious. Um, do you have recruitment issues uh, versus high tech and recruitment in general because you deal with some really very specialist type recruitment. And great question and, and your point at the end about uh, uh, 
specialist is, is spot on. I did have it on my slide, but I didn't go over it too much, primarily because I've discussed this with the board uh, many times. But I'll tell you, you know, hospitals are very dynamic organizations in, in many ways. And I've always said in one way is because if you look at all of our workforce and the various specialties, a majority of them are highly trained, highly educated, highly skilled, and we call for a fairly high uh, salary because of that. And that's con going to continue to be a challenge. Um, and we, we're doing pretty well at Copley as far as recruitment and retention, but it's something that we talk about every other week at a, a meeting that we have scheduled. And, and because it's that important. Without good, good people, any organization is dead in the water, in my opinion. Any other questions or comments from the public? Okay. I see one person with their hand kind of up. But this gentleman has his hand all the way up, so go ahead, sir. Uh, my name is Carl Schlehetka. This is just a housekeeping sorry, issue. I didn't get the last name. Schlehetka. I can't. It's S Z L A C H. E T K A. Uh, this is more of a housekeeping issue. Uh, it's very, very difficult to hear some of your folks, particularly the healthcare advocate, so that for future hearings, I would ask that she actually speak directly into the microphone because we couldn't hear a word she said back here. And then some of your board members also, if they could just uh, more directly speak into the mic, it would be very helpful to the public out here. Thank you for that feedback. We, uh Try to make sure that everybody gets close to the mic, but we're all guilty. Yeah, I times. Yeah. <laughs> so anyone else? If not, um, my apologies to the people from North Country. Uh, we are already past the time that we were supposed to start on their hearing. But uh, we are going to take a 20-minute break for lunch. So thank you, uh, Team Copley. Thank you, Sherman. Thank you. We'll start again in 20 minutes. <laughs>